have been having discussions about the vastness of our human history and the exploration of it so that we can come to not a consensus, but just really track to see what has happened in our ancient past and what the ancients knew about our existence. Not only what did they know, but why do they have such advanced structures and have such a great understanding of harmonics and frequency. So this presentation here is part of a large presentation that's actually a four hour presentation that's available for free for all of you right now on portal to ascension.org. Once you log in, type in my name or just click my name or type in sound and it will come up for you. And so I'm gonna do just a little bit of this presentation where we're gonna talk about ancient civilizations. But before I get into that, I wanna tell you this quote right here really explains why I even did a sound presentation in the first place. And every one of my presentations begins with something like, let's start with why I did this. So why did I do this presentation? Well, this quote really says it all. And if you can just integrate this quote and listen to it um, and feel this quote, maybe you'll understand that. The forms of snowflakes and the faces of flowers may take on their shape because they are responding to some sound in nature. Likewise, <clears throat> It is possible that crystals, plants, and human beings may be in some way music that is taken on musical, uh, taken on visible form. It's very interesting there, saying that basically a vibration. So we know how a vibrations and frequencies affect snowflakes and fl flowers. So maybe plants and human beings may also be that that music or vibration taken on physical form. And I think that is, from my research, is true. Nikola Tesla even said. If you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. So why sound? Well, if you want to understand the secrets of the universe, check, I want to understand the secrets of the universe, or I want to look for them at least and explore them. Energy, frequency, and vibration. Plus, if we're all made out of subatomic particles and all subatomic particles are vibrating, then technically, why sound? Because everything is sound. In the beginning was the word. The universal ground facts of this presentation we are vibratory energy beings. Our brains produce electricity. Yep, the acid in our brains goes around, produces an electrical current, goes down our nervous system, fuels our nervous system, goes down our spine, goes into every organ, pumps every organ, ensures that we continue to stay alive, which is why you're not technically dead unless you are brain dead because the electricity that pumps your organs, the frequency coming out is still, is not, is still there until that point. Vibration and frequency is measured in hertz. The universe is singing the music of the spheres. We are now able to quantify and actually take the audio frequencies that are coming out of certain planets and put them into audio form. And we're able to hear the sounds on a YouTube. Almost every planet sound has been uploaded to YouTube. And here we go with the ancient history component. Humans have lived on earth for hundreds of thousands of years, more than widely accepted. All ancient religions, civilizations, and origin stories seem to talk about sound. Even some of these origin stories that maybe you think that it doesn't talk about sound actually have some sort of terminology in there that you can relate to frequency and vibration. So it seems like there is a common thread in our ancient history and is connected to the concept of frequency and sound. The universe is full of frequency. Everything vibrates. We only hear and see a limited frequency range. Countless inaudible frequencies are around us always. Here's an image really quick of myself and my wife at a sound, um, sound bath that we facilitated a couple of years ago. I'm skipping forward to ancient civilizations. The slides that I just passed are basically explaining the physiology of the human body. I feel that a lot of us here probably are aware that sound or vibrational frequency is a science that can affect us in a harmonious way and assist us in you know, empowerment, upliftment, healing, all types of things. Um, and even traveling, maybe interdimensionally, maybe even space travel when it comes to quantum physics and bending space time. So those are those slides that I'm gonna skip over right now because we're getting into the ancient civilizations component of this presentation. When I was doing research for my origin stories presentation, but also for this one, you know, I said that I went over a hundred different origin stories, but <clears throat> I would find sound and resonance in so many of those creation stories. Many creation myths begin actually with God, God, whatever you want to call God, speaking or singing the universe into being. Even in the conventional scientific um, theory, the Big Bang, 
what's the bang? The bang is a sound, right? The vibration of the sound, the big bang. The universe was sung into creation. That's an Egyptian saying right there about the universe literally being sung into existence. And of course, in Hinduism, which comes from ancient Vedic wisdom that comes from uh, the Indus civilization, that comes from even further back, probably into the land of Kush in Egypt, we have Om. And we even have every chakra having its own sound. So we're definitely noticing a common thread here of sound and vibration in many stories. There is one origin story that I'm going to share with you right now. This origin story is from the Laguna Pueblo Native American Indian creation story. Not, I just copied and pasted that. I don't like to say Indian because I'm Indian and that's from India. So really is Native American. I don't even like to say, uh, this is like a side note right here. I wish we knew all the names of all the tribes so we can give them all credit in the right ways rather than giving like a term of indigenous or natives, you know? So these are the Laguna Pueblo natives of the Americas. And this other quote here explains the science in a metaphoric way. So this quote explains the science in a metaphoric way. In my longer presentation, I break down each sentence here, but I feel like a lot of people here are ready to understand and accept this. So I'm just gonna read it and then you can kind of reflect on it yourself. In the center of the universe, she sang. In the midst of the water, she sang. In the midst of heaven, she sang. In the center, she sang. Her singing made all the worlds, the worlds of the spirits, the worlds of the people, the worlds of the creatures, the worlds of the gods, lowercase g. In this way, she separated the quarters. Singing, she separated. Upon the face of heaven, she placed her song. Upon the face of water, she placed her song. Thus placed her song. Thus she placed her will. Thus wove her design. Thus sang the spider. Thus she thought. This origin story says it all. You know, probably more than this exists, but it says a lot. The female energy, center of the universe, vibrating. The vibration created all of these things. The vibration even created the dimensions of the gods. And it was all from one thought. The Australian Aborigines also speak of three sacred songs. The song passed sung by the primordial ancestor spirits who walked across their landscape, singing its landforms into being. We have the six days of creation, which go, um, coincide with the six aspects of Om, the six sophagial tones, the six aspects of the eye, all-seeing eye of Horus. And then in the Krishna Yayurveda, there's a, a line there that you might think sounds very similar to another text. In the beginning was Brahman, with whom was the word, and the word is Brahman. What does that sound like? Well, it sounds like John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning there was the word, and the word was God. And one of the, the, one of the biggest, largest, most well-known, I guess, creation story in the world that um, speaks about sound is actually in one of the largest religions in the world, so, um, in he, the Hebrew faith, as well as Christianity. Let's break this down. <clears throat> in the beginning was the word. What's the word? The word is sound. And the word was with God. And the word was God. This line has now told us that in the beginning was sound. And this line has also told us that all of creation exists in a paradox. Why? The word was with God and the word was God. Those are two paradoxical items. The word was with God right next to it. Two people, two things, two entities, two vibrations. And the word was actually God. He, this is where some people get lost. He was with God. Some people think he's talking about Jesus, and some people think he's talking about God still. But look at what we're talking about here. He. What is he? He is the word. The word was with God in the beginning. Through the word, all things were made. Without the word, nothing was made that has been made. I love that line. Without the word, nothing was made that has been made. Without the sound. In him, who's him? The sound, the word. In the word was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Another really telling line right there. The word, the sound, became the light. So it's everywhere, right? And let's just dive into ancient Egypt. I think we're going to have time just to go over like two ancient civilizations probably and their use and awareness of sound and frequency. This video right here, I'll just tell you what it is. 
Um, this is a video of Robert Schock at the Portal to Ascension Conference 2019, live in Irvine, California, Robert Schock. And he's speaking about the geological evidence of the fact that the pyramid, I mean, the Sphinx is probably at least 13,000 years old um, through you know geological studies and also the the fate the positioning of the Sphinx in regards to the constellation of Leo, everything lines up with that time right there, which completely shifts the timeline for what we've been conventionally told about Egypt. There is a documentary called The Pyramid Code on Netflix. Many amazing people: John Anthony West, Robert Shaw, Robert Baval, Graham Hancock, a few other people are in it, and in there they show a cross intersection cut out kind of like this of the pyramid of one of the pyramids on the Giza plateau. And in that they showed that underneath the pyramids, let's show you here, if you can follow my arrow right here with this white line is there is a bunch of aqueducts. There's an aqueduct underneath the pyramids, right? What used to happen is when the Nile river would over flood, overflow during certain seasons, the water would go underneath the pyramid. This has all pro been proven to actually exist. And the pyramid code shows it to us. And in the aqueducts, there were copper rods that were in the aqueducts that go and leave lead all the way to the pyramid. And when they lead and go to the pyramid, they end up in hollowed out tubes. So what's happening here? We have water going in down underneath the aqueducts, creating an electrical current, carrying the current through the copper rods, the copper rods going up into the pyramid, turning into this area that's a hollowed out tube, becoming an acoustic sound, um, acoustic sound basically speaker that would take the electrical current and convert it into a sound. So that goes to the theory of that these pyramids were some power generating device. And I believe that the world by pyramid culture was, you know, as JJ and Desiree said earlier today was multifaceted and used for multiple reasons, but definitely one of the reasons was probably to harness the natural frequency of earth, especially over the ley lines to keep the vibration of the planet at a steady consistent level so that we would no longer fall from grace because we were on that devolution route, especially after a huge cataclysm that occurred and many advanced civilizations kind of had to start from scratch, but a lot of that information was still there because we were in a Satya Yuga. We were in a golden age when the cataclysm happened 13,000 years ago. For the 2,000 years after that cataclysm occurred, we were still in the golden age going down into a lower age. So our human's ability was at a very high level, even though we were experiencing cataclysms on the planet. In Egypt, we have sound that was we have some theories of you know how sound was used in Egypt and some people say that sound was used to create megalithic structures most likely. <clears throat> 2600 BC papyrus states the Great Pyramid of Giza was created in 20 years. Okay, the pyramid contains about 2.3 million individual blocks of stone, meaning one block would have to be laid every five minutes of every hour, 24 hours a day for 20 years. But the problem with that is each block weighs around two tons and they didn't seem to be natural to the region. They had to pull it from somewhere else. So that's about 1,764,000 pounds of stone being laid every day for 20 years. If we listen to the way they tell us these were created. So could it have been levitation? There's many different theories. I'm just offering you theories here. I'm not telling you which one it is. Levitation or not built in 2600 BC, or maybe it was a combination of both. The Egyptian language even was created in a way to emphasize specific frequencies. My research has led me to believe that the Indus civilization, which Mohenjo-daro was part of, was an off, basically a breakaway civilization from the land of Kush and Kem from Egypt, the great civilization. <clears throat> if you listen to Sanskrit, which is, you know, it, ancient Egyptian is not really a common tongue anymore, but Hindi is, which is directly connected to Sanskrit <clears throat> and all the rites and rituals within Hinduism are using Sanskrit words. Excuse me one second. You can tell that this language, especially Sanskrit, which probably derived from this, it's emphasizing certain frequencies and tones. Here's an example. I'm gonna do the Gayatri mantra. Om Bhubhava Swaha Tatravitar Vareni Yambrago Devasya Di Mahi Diyo Yona Prajotiyata Om Burbhava Soha Tatravitar Vareni Yambrago Devasya Di Mahi Diyo Yona Prajotiyata You can see how it's emphasized, right? How it's almost like a piercing frequency. 
sound frequency is generated by aqueducts. So this is what I showed you in the other one that turn the frequency into maybe a sound and vibration that would go in or at least fuel and provide energy and power to the pyramid. The Great Pyramid of Giza could have been a power plant using with frequencies in mind. And experiments conducted by an individual named Tom Danley in the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid and in the chambers above the King Chamber suggest that the pyramid was constructed with sonic purpose. Danley identifies four resonant frequencies or notes that are enhanced by the structure of the pyramid and by the materials used in its construction. The notes start from an F sharp chord, which according to ancient Egyptian texts were the harmonic replica of earth. Danley's tests show that these frequencies are present in the king's chamber even when no sounds are being produced. They were there in frequencies that range from 16 hertz down to half hertz, well below the range of human hearing. According to Danley, these vibrations are caused by the wind blowing across the ends of the so-called shafts. If you see my full presentation, you'll see my wife and myself in Palenque, where they have all these amazing um, way to ventilate and move air through these acoustic pyramid structures that seem to actually trigger certain areas to resonate specific vibrations. And they, they, there were such geniuses in their architecture that not only could you play a music, a sound in there or get a frequency in there and play something audible, but even these frequencies and notes were actually being triggered even when nothing was occurring just from simply from the wind passing through. And we are now rediscovering that we can utilize levitation. We can utilize levitation in order to move rock. And here's a video of that. This video here is of Brian Forrester. I'm also going to skip this one, but I can tell you what's going to happen in here. Basically, he's inside the red pyramid. Basically, he's inside the red pyramid, and they're testing and chanting in the red pyramid and trying to figure out what tone is being reflected back to them. And they play it on a keyboard and they test it out, and the tone comes out to to A. Within Egyptian. Um, scriptures, hieroglyphs, we see this right here, the Eye of Horus, which is very interestingly, the exact same depiction of a cross -sec intersection, intersection of our brain that is our pituitary and pineal gland. So, and it is the same exact style. It's very interesting that not only, you know, is this eye can represent the third eye and awakening, but the image that they created of it is actually an image of how it really physically looks within our brain, which then opens up the question of what did these um, ancient people of the land of Chem actually know? What did they know? How did they know this information? Did they have advanced sciences where they're able to dissect the brain and figure it out? Were they meditating on something and got into a level of consciousness that they figured it out? Were they given some intervention or some information from, from star beings? Whatever the answer is, it does go into the awareness and the realization that these ancient people were definitely much more advanced than we've been told. And this Eye of Horus is just such a beautiful depiction. It actually also represents mathematical slash musical intervals. Vowel sounds were not used in ancient world. Just like we spoke about earlier with Manu about how the lioness was a representation of the introduction of language to humanity before that, not language, written word, written words to humanity. Before that, it seems that there was a possibility that telepathy was utilized and that it wasn't that we evolved to a state that now we can write down. It was maybe a devolution that we got to a place where we weren't able to have constant telepathic communication with each other. And because of that situation, in language started getting introduced, but even vowels, vowels weren't introduced until later. For example, the word ankh, right? Ankh, A-N-K-H, is actually, the A is silent. The A represents Amen-Ra, A for Amen-Ra. 
the N represents the deity, the K represents the deity, the H represents the deity, but Amin Ra was the silent world, the invisible world. So Ankh was actually pronounced Ankh, Ankh, N-K-H, not A-N-K-H, N-K-H, because the A, the vowel wasn't introduced until later. Fast, oh, moving to a, the other side of Africa. We started up North Africa, now we're going South. And uh, Michael Tellinger is the foremost researcher on this. We do a lot of work together, did a course with him yesterday morning. And he, there's a place there called Adam's Calendar. And there's actually stone circles like this that go all the way up the West Coast of Africa. There's documentaries you can take a look at. But in South Africa, there's many, many stone circles like this thousands of them. And scientific evaluation of these stone circles has shown that circular structures are energy generating devices using the natural sound harmonic frequencies that emanate from the surface of the earth. All of these stones are made out of something called dolerite that is not actually natural to the region. And it seems like that there is no, there are no tool marks on this. They can't tell really how it was made. It almost seems like it was projected and raised out of the ground naturally with some sort of like technology consciousness, just in the way that it was created. And each of these represents the cymatic configurement of the localized frequency in that area. That these are actually some huge cymatic. Um, Technolo technological devices that raise out of the ground. Plus many of these have the same effect as crop circles. When you go in it, your compass no longer works, your phone is acting up on you. So there's some sort of frequency going on there. There's estimated that these structures are about 75,000 years old. The shape of the circular ruins are very specific because each circle represents geometrical shapes of sound energy. The theory is, and here you can see like geometry of just a, one of these stone circles, very intricate here. Ancient gold, so the theory is that there are ancient gold mines are underneath these structures. Well, there are mines underneath these structures, but the theory is that their gold mines show evidence that these structures may have been utilized in an ancient gold mining operation, introduced the Anunnaki or whatever beings were here mining gold or advanced humanity on earth mining gold 75,000 plus years ago. So possibly that these devices are generating a frequency that assisted in the extraction of gold from the earth. And here we go again, like many ancient structures, there's an alignment with Orion's constellation. The frequencies of these structures actually go into the gigahertz level, which is over 380 gigahertz, which are basically unheard of on earth today in any normal applications. So this Spanish civilization obviously had a really great understanding of energy and frequency that we're still not able to figure out today. And on these structures there, you can pull out these fossil looking things that are actually fossils, petrified bone it seems to be, that are actually in the walls of these structures. And some of them have a really interesting, actually all of them have a really interesting harmonic effect. I'm going to show you how they ring like bells um, because I can't carry these with me all over the world. So a quick demonstration how these stones ring like bells. I just discovered I can actually feel my fingers underneath are deadening the ringing because I'm holding it and it's deadening some of the effect. There we go. That's better. That's what you want. You realize that this thing really rings like a bell and it reverberates for quite a long time. So there's some sort of harmonic frequency going on there. Now, this is great that we're going to probably end with this civilization here and this these structures here because Alan actually spoke about it. So how amazing is it right now? We get to actually bring it full circle and bring it back to what we spoke about in the panel. He spoke about a place in India called Hampi, India. There's a temple there dedicated to the deity called Vitala. You can see here's a picture of the motherland. Here's Hampi right down here. This is one of the temples. Here you can see how beautiful it looks. So this temple was actually dedicated to a deity called Vitala. 
Maybe you've never heard of Vitala before. I didn't until I actually started researching this. And basically Vitala is the combination of two deities because there's the Trinity. We have Brahma, we have, um, we have Brahman, we have Vishnu, we have Shiva, the Trinity, right? Like the Father, the Son, and Holy Ghost, except it transcends gender because it's not patriarchal. But they're, the combination of two of these deities into one becomes a hybrid ET, hybrid God, whatever you want to call it. And it's Shiva plus Vishnu equals Vitala. Both of them combining their consciousness together creates this deity. And Shiva's drum, Shiva has a drum, as you can see right here in the trident. Shiva's drum does the sound of Om, boom, boom, boom. It's the heartbeat of the universe. And Vishnu has a conch that also does the sound of Om, but through the conch. That's the vibration that permeates throughout the universe. And together, they create this god that is the god Vitala, that is the vibrational frequency deity. Constructing during King Devarias II's reign from 1442 to 1446, there is something there called the musical pillars of the Ranga Mantapa. The Ranga Mantapa is one of the main attractions at the temple. The large Mantapa is renowned for its 56 musical pillars. These musical pillars are also known as the Saregama pillars, the Saregama pillars. Just like in the Western world, we have the Sophasia tones, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti. Well, that's you know, stemmed from Pythagoras' awareness and really he was the father of the Western music scale. But then we have the Eastern music scale. The, the counterpart to the solfejos in the West is the Saregama sounds, Saregama, like that. So it goes higher and higher. So these are called the Saregama pillars. The reason why they call the Saregama pillars is because Saregama are actually connected to the chakras and each of those chakras have a specific frequency. And when you play these pillars, it actually has the tones of those frequencies coming out. But what's really interesting is there are pillars there that have different tones of different instruments, but they all have the same frequencies, but utilizing different instruments, just like Vishnu and Shiva had do two different instruments creating the same frequency. ancient wisdom carried up into India probably a few thousand years after this awareness was really like cultivated they maintained some sort of information some sort of technology because when they went when the British went to India and went to Hampi they decided to cut open a few of these pillars to see what's up with them, what's going on inside it. They found that there was just stone inside it. They all looked exactly the same. They had no idea and couldn't figure out, and to this day, people can't figure out how they created these in the first place. What was done in order to do it? What kind of technology were they utilizing? So these pillars were designed to imitate the sound of different instruments. No matter what instrument it sounded like, each pillar followed the same exact notes of the Indian classical Sarigama scale. Each sound is a journey from the root chakra to the crown, all the way from the bottom of the pillar to the crown. So what would happen when it would be windy? What would happen when it would be raining? All of these sounds would be emanating, just like in Palenque, just like in many other areas that we've either visited or we have not yet, but we've researched. It has these frequency that just natural sound, the wind can actually stimulate, the rain can stimulate. And then even if you don't hear it, the frequency is still continuing just from the simple act of wind actually touching these structures. Here is an image here of the Saragama scale and how it's connected to each chakra. And you can see how Sa starts at the C note and it goes all the way up to Ni, which is the B note. So these pillars had the chakra system in mind. And we are going to go to Palenque because we do have 10 more minutes. So in Palenque, my wife and I have visited a couple of times, love the Yucatan Peninsula. We're taking a tour of some people to ancient 
uh, Civilizations Tour as our first international Portal to Ascension Tour November this year. If you're interested, uh, we're going to do it again next year. Look, give us your email. We can give you some information about you know when we do it or just contact us from the site and we can set something up. But Palenque is one of the sites that we visited and it's truly an epic site because right here, you're only looking at really the main excavated area. Behind this, where you see the forest, there's over 1,400 temples and pyramids that are unexcavated. Here's my wife and myself climbing over some of these unexcavated pyramids. Stairs of a pyramid. And you can see it because it elevates. That's a pyramid right there. Like literally the rock and everything, how it's going up, we're on top of it. ¿Cuántos pirámides? Temples. 1473. 1473 unexcavated pirámides. 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 In, um, in this area right here. And here's one of them. Wow. It's wonderful. So Palenque was known to be a central hub for trade, commerce, diplomacy, and foreign affairs. Many different ethnic groups were represented here. Many have been in an area for global affairs and great minds to share ideas. There's a pyramid structure there that was specifically for all the intellectuals, scientists, mathematicians, astronomers, etc. They lived and worked in this building and there was an area on top. And here it is, the top of the pyramid here. And they would gather here in this area and they would have discussions about creating the Maya empire, in the beginning phases of it all. They would share ideas, information, um, welcome foreign um, dignitaries that were coming in to share information as well. And this entire structure actually used to have a roof. If you can follow my cursor right here, you can hardly barely see it, but behind here is a slab. Over here is a slab as well. These slabs were all originally a part of the roof. All right, so last time we're here, we can't, unfortunately we can't go into that side right now. It's closed off for some reason. There's a slab you right there. See that slab right there and the slab on the right hand side. Those are actually part of the roof originally. This whole thing had a roof over it. And even though they're solid rock, and we have a clip that I'm gonna look for at home, see if I can plug it in here. Uh, when you hit those rocks, they make these harmonics, these beautiful harmonics, where as when they were over here and as the roof, when they were part of the roof, when it would rain, whereas in India, for example, we actually have pillars that were made to give you the same sounds as the solfejos, which in Indian scriptures are actually saregama and not, not sol, re, mi, da, which actually represent each of the chakra symbols. Also in uh, Egypt, they have these, I think also pillars that uh, we've yet to see, but I've been told that when the wind blows, it's the same type of thing. So pyramids and structures were known to have sound frequency from nature. So there is definitely something going on in regards to ancient sites and their awareness of sound frequency, but done in such a beautiful way, acoustically, without creating damage and pollution through these rock structures. And just like I showed you in Hampi, basically that whole entire area was covered by the roof with the, those stone slabs. And the video I couldn't find was us going up to those slabs because in that time we went there, it was closed off that area. But the time before we went there, we were playing those stone slabs, just like that guy in Hampi, India was playing those drums. We were playing around with it and they were emanating this frequency. So imagine the astronomers, all the mathematicians, the elite of society, not in a negative way, elite like we have now, but the elite people that were creating the society and sharing ideas, all sitting in that area with the entire structure designed to not only emanate frequencies and harmonics, but when it would rain, when it would, the wind would come through, or just the natural flow of the wind would create either a subtle frequency or an actual audible one just from the bombardment off the roof or just touching the stones around there. And of course, we have other stories, right, of levitation and frequency. The Puma Punku H blocks, local folklore says that there were two, there were, there's two different, for both of these, Stonehenge and the ancient um, H blocks, that some people have stories that they were levitated into place. There's other stories that giants actually brought them and put into place. Maybe the giants <laughs> levitated them and put them into place. So we just find this awareness around the world. Last ancient site, 
County Meath, Ireland. There's a 5,000 year old structure found to be amplifying the Earth's natural magnetic frequency in that area, which is 110 Hertz. So we can, what I've shared with you so far, we can split into two things. Frequencies of structures that are utilizing the Earth's frequency in order to create some sort of effect, right? And then we also have man-made structures, human-made structures that are emanating these frequencies um, by being like, by some sort of technology, by wind, rain, whatever, with somebody playing it, that is also emanating a frequency. This structure in County Meath, Ireland is thought to have been built around 3200 BCE in the Neolithic period, the last part of the Stone Age and older than Stonehenge. And here it is right here. On February 17th in 2012, Vancouver Archaeoacoustics Convention, which was a mainstream archaeoacoustics convention, which were archaeologists and anthropologists, excuse me as I sneeze, and scientists got together to discuss the sound and resonance properties of ancient sites. They went to Malta and tested the frequency and discovered it resonated at 110 hertz. Same as County Meath Ireland, same as many ancient sites, 110 hertz. Well, is there any scientific evidence of what happens with 110 hertz? First of all, Ancient Aliens has a show called The Alien Frequency. It's all about 110 hertz if you really want to look into it. But EEG tests were done to see what part of the brain responds to 110 hertz. They discovered that it stimulates the area responsible for visuals and creativity. Some participants who were a part of the study claimed that they had an out-of-body experience. So we're not talking about disclosure enthusiasts here. We're not talking about spiritualists and yogis here. We're talking about mainstream conventional archeologists and researchers uh, that were going to try to figure out what was happening with this frequency, what occurs, and they were claiming to have out-of-body experiences. Researchers detected the presence of a strong double resonant frequency at 70 Hertz and 114 Hertz, another a double octave frequency as well. And now physics.org, there's an archaeologist named Fernando Coibra. He said that he felt sound crossing his body at high speed by being connected in that area to 110 hertz, leaving a sensation of relaxation. When it was repeated, the sensation returned, and he also had the illusion that the sound was reflected from his body to the ancient red ochre paintings on the walls. One can only imagine, it's physics at work, one can only imagine the experience in antiquity, standing in what must have been somewhat odorous, dark, and listening to ritual chant while low light flickering on the bones of one's departed ones. Many um, skeletal remains found there. In the publication from the conference on archaeoacoustics, which sparked the study, Dr. Paolo de Beritolis reports on tests conducted at the Clinical Neurophysiology Unit at the University of Tristi in Italy. Each volunteer has their own individual frequency of activation always between 90 and 120 Hertz. Those volunteers, these are the people that went there by doing the tests and the studies, every of them were act being activated at different levels. Those volunteers with frontal lobe prevalence during the testing received ideas and thoughts similar to what happens during meditation, whilst those with occipital lobe prevalence visualized images. They broke it down. What happens to different people depending on what parts of the brain get stimulated? He goes on to state that under the right circumstances, ancient populations were able to obtain different states of consciousness without the use of drugs or other chemical substances by frequencies. Clinical neurophysiology, mainstream archeologists, not an alternative archeologist. And they're having these experiences themselves. So either it's an ancient structure that got reused later um, in order to put you know, the departed loved ones in there, or maybe it was created and the 110 hertz frequency may have something to do with connecting to the other realms of the dimensions that they felt that by putting their loved ones in there, it would be an easier transition from this world into the next world because of these frequencies. But whatever it was, they definitely had an advanced awareness of sound and vibration. So at this point, I'll leave it on this slide here. There's immense amount of evidence from ancient scriptures and scientific evaluation of ancient sites and proof of advanced sound technology. So it's really harder to disprove the ancients had an advanced awareness of vibration and frequency than it is to prove it. So if anybody tries to argue all day saying, or not all day, but for an hour, whatever, if they tried to argue with you saying that, well, how would they have this awareness of sound or vibration or frequency if they were so primitive? 
at this point, there's just too much research out there to deny that they didn't have that. And one of those is the physics.org article right here on what they experienced and the out-of-body experiences they got just by being connected to 110 Hertz. Okay, so I'm gonna close out this presentation. That's it for that. Thank you so much everybody for tuning in and listening to it. Okay, thank you so much everybody. I'm gonna go ahead now and we are almost done with the conference and I'm gonna go ahead and see which speakers we have on and let's start bringing everybody on. Um, whoever is a panelist right now, Brandon, Joan, do you guys wanna join me? Awesome presentation. I just want to stop and give you kudos, Neil, for um, all the amazing research you have done in so many fields. You're a master of so many, all because you're following your own bliss. Thank you, John. I love you. Thank you. I love you, too. All right. So we're bringing everybody on now. We're in the final stretch of today. I hope you guys enjoyed the last four days. You do have unlimited replay access. It's available immediately on our website. Please do support us in any way possible, whether it's signing up for our email list, clicking the subscribe button on YouTube, especially if you're watching right now, it's right there underneath. Go ahead and click that. Or if you want to donate, you can donate to our PayPal or you can join our Patreon. And your contribution just allows us to do more and more of these, and especially more and more of the free events, right? So if you contribute, we can do bigger ones of these. After this four days, I've had some ideas on other topics that I'm going to do as free two-day events as well. Um, over the year, I think we'll probably do four different ones, two Portal to Ascension conferences, and then we're also going to do some other ones on different topics too, definitely with ancient history. So go ahead and if you want to check out any more or sign up to our email list, go to portal2ascension.org and you can check it out there. Mm -hmm.